before I start, I'd like to uh, ask you all to get your sort of creative hats on and uh, sort of hear me out on this concept. To test the concept, um, SSI were uh, amazing. They helped us do some research. They interviewed just under 500 respondents um, where we asked them, uh, you know, about their gaming habits, what their favourite game was when they were younger, what their favourite game is now, what consoles they own and use, uh, what consoles they own and don't use, because that's quite telling as well. And uh, we've got some data out of that, which you can read, read in the paper after. Um, considering this has been um, you know, a, a concept that people have been talking about for just a couple of months, it's really gained a lot of momentum. And if you type uh, the hashtag new MR into Twitter or uh, gamif gamifying or gamification, um, you'll be able to see what some people have been saying about research through gaming over the last couple of months. As with all uh, new concepts, there's always some sceptics, which is great because they ask the questions that we need to answer. Um, but generally, people have gotten really excited about this concept and, and talking about it quite a lot, which is great. So what is research through gaming? What, what is it supposed to be? Well, um, I've kind of defined it as where a company can gain data from the actions a respondent takes while playing a computer game and the way they play the game itself. And that, that last part, the way they play, is, is as important as everything else. And that includes how long they take to play the game, um, you know, what they do on one hand that they've done differently on the other, and that can be quite telling as well, depending on what the research is. Well, I didn't really realise how big that chimpanzee was going to be. Um, research through gaming can offer opportunities for engaging our respondents more, building, um, you know, fabulous, really interactive, engaging communities, um, an opportunity for fun, and a breakthrough in market research, um, as our response rates have been declining and people talk about that a, a huge amount. Um, you know, it's an avenue that we could explore. I just want to say, though, that no one is saying that we should make uh, these research games, you know, the, the research equivalent of Call of Duty. No one's saying that they should be that graphic, that complex. Um, what we're just simply saying is we should um, engage our respondents in a way that you can offer a little bit of a, a competition. They can get a, an incentive that's more applicable to them and what they do. Um, and an example of putting some fun into something sort of deemed as boring or hard work is, is this. So this is just a little analogy I found. Um, in a train station in Stockholm called Oldenplan, um, Volkswagen, this is a Volkswagen case study, um, they decided to make a, a flight of stairs into a giant piano. I'm sure at the time people thought, that's pretty crazy, it's not feasible, why are we doing this, it's going to cost a hell of a lot of money. But actually, it worked. 66% more people use those stairs than the ascending escalator. So it just kind of goes to show that something that is just a little bit radical can, can work, and there's no reason why we shouldn't give it a try. So yeah, why would research games work? So I've just put together a couple of, a couple of reasons, I guess, to, to convince you all. So the first thing is that response rates are in decline. Um, when I started in market research just a few years ago, I remember the uh, NAT rep for the UK was something like a 10% response rate and you could easily get that, that research done in a few days. Uh, whereas now, from my understanding, it's less than 2%. So we know that. I mean, you know, this has been going on for a long time. And also, it's no wonder, really. I mean, if you just type in su surveys into Google, what Google image, rather, what comes up looks rather dire, rather boring. So we should inject some fun. Reason two, attention spans are in decline. Has anybody seen Up? the Pixar film, you know, they've got that squirrel syndrome. Well, I mean, re attention spans are in decline, um, and we know it. I mean, any parents out there will be nodding their head, yeah, my kids don't ever listen to me for longer than five minutes. Well, if that's the case, and we know attention spans are in decline, then we should do some more research on that. Uh, the BBC done a survey where they, they monitored that students in the UK had, on average, a 10-minute attention span. And if that's the research and if that's the case, and it was quite a big study, then we shouldn't really be sending people in that age group and that demographic, you know, 25, 30-minute surveys. However, people play games for hours. Um, in, in our research with SSI, we saw that people playing on their games consoles could play up to five hours in one sitting. That's incredible. I don't really know anything else off the top of my head that I could spend five hours doing. But yeah, I mean, you know, people can uh, 
dip into games here and there on the phone for five minutes at a time and uh, go online you know, for, for an hour. But generally, our research showed that um, up to 10 hours people would play games on their consoles. This is a third reason, and it's quite exciting. There are huge developments in the gaming industry. Um, I'm an avid gamer. I keep up to date with, with the games industry. It's just sort of a, an, an extra thing on the side that I, that I do, and obviously it's applicable to me because I work for a software company. In 2009, there was a one billion pound investment in the gaming industry and that drives technological development that drives creative development and the gaming industry is as you can imagine incredibly creative and if the MR industry is so used to jumping on technological bandwagons I really don't see why we couldn't latch latch onto this a little bit as well. Um, one example of a development in, in the gaming industry is um, at the bottom there you can see this is a Microsoft employee and she's talking to a young sort of digitised boy on, on the screen. This is Project Milo. Milo there can recognise her voice, can recognise emotion in her tone, has a memory, interacts with his, his own environment there, he's, he's got a pool there, he's got some trees. And, you know, she's in this video, this is just a screenshot from the video, she's talking to him and she's saying, Milo, have you done your homework? And he's like, no. And he's like, why can't we go and swim instead? So he throws her some goggles, and of course, because it's, it's 3D, it seems to come at her. But also, because she feels so engaged with him, she actually bends down to catch the goggles. It just goes to show how, how far you know, advanced the gaming industry has got. It's, it's really quite incredible. If you think about this in a, in a research term, you know, I mean, the possibility is only this. The scope for research there is huge. Reason four, online gaming communities. PlayStation, the recent press release, told us that it has 13,000 users daily uh, playing simultaneously um, for three hours on the trot, sort of in, in one sitting. Um, 13,000 users daily. That's, that's, that could be a potentially a huge pool of respondents if you think about, if, if you think about it like that. And um, I've been on the uh, PlayStation site, and it is a really engaging uh, online community they've got. I mean, fair enough, the, the gamers are talking about gaming to each other, um, but if research games existed and they were engaging and fun, there's no reason why respondents couldn't do that too. And there is scope for true real-time research as well. I have the Street Fighter app on, on my iPhone, I play Street Fighter and I, sometimes I play against one of my housemates and she's often upstairs in her bed and we're playing against each other and it's incredible, I mean it's something that we take for granted but it's incredible that two people under the same roof or, or indeed in a, in a different house can interact with something virtually on a phone. If, you were, if your end client was a restaurateur for example, you know, think about the respondents being able to uh, engage in a, in a research game or something on, on a mobile app as, as uh, it was discussed yesterday and get sort of real-time um, feedback of what different diners thought in different restaurants and, uh, you know, again, more, more examples come to mind. Reason five, uh, six and seven, in fact, really refer to the mobile app discussions uh, going on yesterday. Uh, mobile app market uh, is to grow by $35 billion dollars by 2014 and over 30% of iPhone app downloads are for games alone. It's actually one of the most popular genre for, for download. Reason six, um, with research games and especially obviously if they're available on the phone, you could play everywhere and at any time. Uh, therefore completely uh, eliminating the confines of being at your laptop, being at your PC, you don't have to be on your desk, you could go anywhere, engage in a research game. Um, at the moment, um, the, the apps that I know of is, is of course the Nebu app uh, at the moment and then there's Surveys and Survey Savvy um, and in, in that uh, you can check your incentives and the points you've earned and any um, surveys that are sort of localised to you using GPS um, but if those were research games it would be great the respondent can go in, take part, go out, go back in, finish off the level or whatever it is and that could be a research game. Entertainment snacking, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Angry Birds. Um, in the gaming industry, entertainment snacking refers to the process where, um, especially obviously on a smartphone or Android phone, the uh, respondent can, uh, sorry, the player can go into the game, play for five minutes while they're waiting at a bus stop, waiting for their dinner to be cooked, wherever it might be, and then go back into the game after. And that's entertainment snacking, just taking short snacks of keeping your mind occupied. Um, you know, again, with, with games, you could do the same thing, and if those were used for research purposes, 
you could just think about how much higher your, your response rates would be if your respondents on the move while they're waiting for something could just dip in, in and out of, of research. Games are already a huge part of our lives. Um, you know, there's a statistic there, the Xbox sells 2.5 million connects in 25 days, so that's huge. There's a, a company called, called Lexus, I'm sure you've all heard of them, the, the uh, car company. Uh, they use games as training programs um, and surgeons um, operate on avatars before humans. 70% of major employers use interactive software. So it's not just people, but companies that are using games um, to better the knowledge of the, the people they work with, um, to, to do practice sessions. I mean, there's flight simulations. And, and this is stuff that isn't new. This has been going on for years. And it's, it's very advanced software. It's very intelligent software. Uh, you can see a screenshot there. This is... Um, this is a medical training program, and as you can see, it, it's quite realistic. Uh, you've got the avatars there, um, the surgeons working on that person there, and then bef they get sort of assessed on that, and then they go into a real-time, real-life environment. Um, you can imagine if this was a research game, you could create your own avatar, be placed in a virtual environment, and this is something I'll touch on later. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it exists It exists very strongly already. And um, the ninth reason is that we're already talking about it. We're already excited about it, as I said before. Um, there's a website called New MR. Um, in December, there was a conference about gaming where 10 speakers were invited to talk about what they thought gaming was and what it could be and what it would mean for the industry and respondents. It was very exciting. Um, also on LinkedIn, there's been discussions about it. Um, and on, on the Research Live website, there's been a couple of articles about it as well. Uh, highbrow newspapers like The Guardian in the UK, which would never really talk about games, are now talking about games. They have a, a column every Tuesday, uh, the, the Games Chatterbox. Uh, the Economist in the uh, UK uh, recently has been telling us how games could improve our lives and things like that. So a lot of people are talking about it and the MR industry has started to as well. One thing um, which um, people, people haven't brought up yet but I think it's important to say with, with the research through gaming concept is that there will be a possibility of classification which you might go, oh my god. Um, however, the Apple Store at the moment, from, from what I've researched, doesn't have any classification on games at the moment. However, there are a lot of different countries that are really hot on the classification topic. Australia is one of them. So um, it might be that if research games existed, um, and obviously I'm sure that they'd be made suitable for the demographic you're aiming for, um, you might need to classify classify the game. Um, I'm not sure if that would require a payment, but later on down the line, um, I would assume that you know uh, those kind of processes would be streamlined. But that's sort of something to watch out for. That's sort of like a pitfall in, in this concept, I, I guess. So this is uh, the snazzy part. What could research games look like? And we've got five types um, that I've thought about. There's actually a bonus sixth type, but that requires a whole paper in itself, and I'll tell you about that a li little bit later. You've got gaming as an incentive, an avatar-based research game, questions as mini-games, social media-based games, and augmented reality-based games. The sixth type would be sixth sense technology research games. Um, there was a TED talk recently where um, a gentleman called Pravin Mystery has invented Sixth Sense technology. Just to touch on it quickly, he basically took some rollers out of a mouse and before you know it, he's got a camera and a projector that he can hang around him and he can literally point to things and take photos just with his fingers because he's got a chip sort of literally taped round his finger. If you think about that in a research concept, somebody could walk down the road and point out an advert and say, that looks interesting to me, or pick up a product and the product, um, sorry, the chip understands what product has been picked up. Um, so please do Google Pravin Mystery Sixth Sense Technology. It's a very interesting talk. 